All right. Well, I'm so excited to be with you guys here at Woven. It's so funny. This spring, God has redirected me every single month with who I think our woman is going to be. And then he's like, curveball, it's somebody else. So no surprise, he did that again now. I've just been itching to be able to talk with you guys and dig into Esther's story. Come on, 414, who knows if perhaps you've been made queen for just such a time as this. I can send you out strong into the summer and you consider the positions that God has placed you in and just make the most of it. But no, God would not let me. I kept trying to dig into Esther's story and I could not move past Vashti's story. Queen Vashti. So if you want to know our woven woman for May, it's Vashti. And I got to be honest, I have never heard anybody teach on Vashti in my whole life. I've been in the church since I was born. I'm 32 years old. I've never heard anybody teach on Vashti. I asked a close friend of mine who's 13 years older than me, who has also been in the church since she was born, to pray for me coming into this time. And I told her I was teaching on Vashti. She said, I got to be honest, I didn't even know who that was when you told me. I've never heard a word about her. To me, that's heartbreaking. So I'm not surprised God would not let me look past her story. It seems to fit what we talk about at Woven as we talk about women in the Bible, not just those who are named and known and familiar, but those who are not assigned names in the scriptures or whose stories are not familiar, but they are named, known, and familiar to God, dearly loved, created, and called according to his purpose. Now, Vashti is a pagan, I'll give you that. Everyone in Esther chapter 1 is Persian. You don't have a single person of God in this first chapter. And yet, it's right here in the center of our Bible. This whole book of Esther is really unique because God is not explicitly named anywhere in it. And yet, here it is, right here for us. In this word, he's given us to show us who he is and how we can walk with him. But it's interesting So many of us know Esther, but so few of us actually know Vashti, but we don't have an Esther without a Vashti. And you see, God uses Esther to save a whole people, God's people, from genocide. So this is about 500 years before the coming of Jesus. You could say without Esther, we don't have Jesus if God's people are killed off. You could say then without Vashti, you don't either. Her story matters. There's a reason why it's here. We could have jumped in to when King Xerxes is searching for a new young bride, but we don't. We start here in chapter 1. So I believe her story deserves to be told. There's a lot we can learn from it. I also fully believe that her story is going to resonate with every single one of us in this room in some way. And I pray that God meets you there. So Without further ado, I'll jump into the story. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. If you've been here before, I like to offer you story time. So if you want to read along, that's fine. But if you also just want to sit back and hear the story, that's fine too. That's how most of the Bible was intended to be heard in the context of community rather than read in isolation. So let's go. Esther chapter 1. These events happened in the days of King Xerxes, who reigned over 127 provinces stretching from India to Ethiopia. At that time, Xerxes ruled his empire from his royal throne at the fortress of Susa. In the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials. He invited all the military officers of Persia and Medea, as well as the princes and nobles of the provinces. The celebration lasted 180 days, a tremendous display of the opulent wealth of his empire, the pomp and splendor of his majesty. When it was all over, the king gave a banquet for all the men, from the greatest to the least, who were in the fortress of Susa. It lasted for seven days and was held in the courtyard of the palace garden. The courtyard was beautifully decorated with white cotton curtains and blue hangings, which were fastened with white linen cords and purple ribbons to silver rings embedded in marble pillars. Gold and silver couches stood on a mosaic pavement of marble, mother of pearl, and other costly stones. Drinks were served in gold goblets of many designs, and there was an abundance of royal wine reflecting the king's generosity. By edict of the king, no limits were placed on the drinking, for the king had instructed all his palace officials to serve each man as much as he wanted. At the same time, Queen Vashti gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. 
On the seventh day of the feast, when King Xerxes was in high spirits because of the wine, he told the seven eunuchs who attended him, Mehuman, Bista, Harbona, Bigta, Abagta, Zetar, and Carcass, to bring Queen Vashti to him with the royal crown on her head. He wanted the nobles and all the other men to gaze on her beauty, for she was a very beautiful woman. But when they conveyed the king's order to Queen Vashti, she refused to come. This made the king furious, and he burned with anger. He immediately consulted with his wise advisors who knew all the Persian laws and customs, for he always asked their advice. The names of these men were Karshena, Shetar, Admata, Tarshish, Marius, Marsena, and Memucan, seven nobles of Persia and Medea. They met with the king regularly and held the highest positions in the empire. What must be done to Queen Vashti, the king demanded. What penalty does the law provide for a queen who refuses to obey the king's orders properly sent through his eunuchs? Memucan answered the king and his nobles. Queen Vashti has wronged not only the king, but also every noble and citizen throughout your empire. Women everywhere will begin to despise their husbands when they learn that Queen Vashti has refused to appear before the king. Before this day is out, the wives of all the king's nobles throughout Persia and Medea will hear what the queen did and will start treating their husbands the same way. There will be no end to their contempt and anger. So, if it please the king, we suggest that you issue a written decree, a law of the Persians and Medes that cannot be revoked. It should order that Queen Vashti be forever banished from the presence of King Xerxes and that the king should choose another queen more worthy than she. When this decree is published throughout the king's vast empire, husbands everywhere, whatever their rank, will receive proper respect from their wives. The king and his nobles thought this made good sense, so he followed Memucan's counsel. He sent letters to all parts of the empire, to each province in its own script and language, proclaiming that every man should be the ruler of his own home and should say whatever he pleases. But after Xerxes' anger had subsided, he began thinking about Vashti and what she had done and the decree he had made. So his personal attendants suggested, let us search the empire to find beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint agents in each province to bring these beautiful young women into the royal harem at the fortress of Susa. Haggai, the king's eunuch in charge of the harem, will see that they are all given beauty treatments. After that, the young woman who most pleases the king will be made queen instead of Vashti. This advice was very appealing to the king, so he put the plan into effect. Yep, <laughs> that's the story. <laughs> I know when I introduced this to our thread group leaders on Sunday, there was quite the response. Um, they, <laughs> I'm sure had read it before, most if not all of you thread group leaders, but it's different when we hear it in the context of community, isn't it? They're like, is this actually in? Yes, read your Bible. It's actually in there. And I believe God has put it in there for us for a reason. So I'm just going to jump in. A few things we should know about this. If you hadn't picked up on it, the tone of this should be interesting. The author of the book of Esther, likely a guy in a culture that favored guys, is using satire to describe the Persian royalty. Okay? He is uh, being extravagant, right? He's He's exaggerating so many things that, you know, King Xerxes rules nearly the entire known world. 127 was, was kind of extreme. And he goes on and on and on about his party, right? And this word all is used so much. He's, he's using satire. This is actually um, a farce, which might sound strange for scripture. But it's important to know that the stories of scripture were often, like I said, told. And so scripture is actually, especially the Old Testament, incredibly entertaining. Um, and so people would have picked up on this. Uh, so it's interesting because the author of Esther, when he is writing about this king, King Xerxes, I hope you pick up on, he is not praising King Xerxes. In fact, he's shaming him because according to Jewish culture, this extravagance, this opulence, this display of your wealth and splendor is not a good thing. And it's certainly not worthy of praise. So actually in Esther chapter 1, it's Queen Vashti who's honored. Even though in real life, it seems like she is not. A 
according to this author and the fact that he includes her in the story and what she does, she's the one who's actually acting as royalty. And it's interesting, you may have noticed that there's a ton of details surrounding King Xerxes, the choices he makes, the parties he's throwing. There's not much there for Queen Vashti. In fact, she doesn't say a single word. But that's actually a literary device that's being used to invite us as the reader into the story to step in, to begin to explore and consider what's between these black and white. Why would she have made this decision? Why would she be doing this? What must have been happening? And I hope if you've been a part of Woven that you've felt that way. I pray you have every month that you have felt free and invited by God to step into the story and explore. He's given us this beautiful book of black and white, of powerful truths. But the black and white doesn't show us the tone, the facial expressions, what's happening, certain words, even we found names of women. So one of my favorite things about seminary was being invited into the story to see in full color behind this black and white. I hope you felt free to do that here at Woven. So that's intentional here. But this story should also get under your skin as a human being, but certainly as a woman. Surely. This kind of treatment. But it breaks my heart to see that most of us don't know Queen Vashti. We don't know her story when she made a really brave and honorable choice. The most powerful man on earth, who also is her husband, she said no. I wish that I had heard this story when I was younger. I wish I'd heard this story as a middle schooler, to be frank. Why have I not? This woman who says no and is honored for it, not here, but by God, I believe she is, that God has her right here in the story before we get to Esther. There is no Esther without Vashti. So a couple of notes. In Persian culture, it wasn't like you always did banquets separate by men and women. This 180-day, six-month party that he threw probably would have been men and women, but now this encore party he throws is just for the guys. And so Queen Vashti throws a party just for the girls. Because here's the thing, Persian wives would have left those co-ed parties, those banquets, when the drinking began. Only prostitutes and concubines would have stayed present with the men. Good things did not happen when the men got to drinking. And let it be known that this seven-day party is clearly a drinking fest. In fact, there's an edict, serve each man as much as he wants. As much as he wants. So when he commands with his seven eunuchs for Queen Vashti to be brought before him and these other men, he says they can gaze on her beauty. He has been showing off everything he owns, and he saved the best for last, his most prized possession, because that is what she is to him, a possession, an object, and pleasure. So she's read, he's ready to bring her before them. And she knows, though, she knows that it won't stop there. It's not like she's going to come before him. They're going to be like, oh, you're so beautiful and you're such a dignified queen. You've done such an amazing job. It's not like a words of affirmation party. No, no. She knows that she is being asked to step into not only a degrading environment, but a dangerous one. There's a professor named Sandra Glan who wrote uh, Vindicating the Vixens, and she has a chapter dedicated to Vashti. And she talks about, in part of it, what happens when men become merry with wine, drunk with wine in the Old Testament. And the first example she gives is in Judges 19, which is a horrific story. I'll say it quickly for you. There's a Levite who lives outside uh, the town of Ephraim, and he has a concubine who runs home to her dad in Bethlehem, and he goes to get her, spends a week there, brings her back, stops in a village on the way to stay the night with this old man. And in the night, he and this old man are drinking. They're becoming merry with wine. And uh, the villagers come, and they knock on the door, beat it down, and demand that his guest, this Levite, be sent out so they can have sex with him the whole night. 
And he says, no, 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 take my young daughter, she's a virgin, and take this concubine. Well, the Levite just rushes out and throws this concubine out there. And y'all, this is in your Bible, Judges 19, but um, they end up taking turns. The Bible says they took turns raping her through the night to where she's unconscious. In the morning, she's laying at his doorstep, and he demands that she get up, and she can't even move. She can't respond. And so he picks her up and saddles her on a donkey, takes her home, cuts her into 12 pieces, and distributes them to the 12 tribes of Israel. That should be horrific. It is. This is the first example she gives of what happens when men become married with wine. Surely Queen Vashti knew that what she was stepping into could cost her her life, not only her dignity, but her life. And why would he, this most powerful king, her husband, ask her to do that? To do that. And he didn't just ask her. He asked her when she was hosting a party for all the women. I was surprised in our coach group. So I owe this to y'all as thread group leaders. Y'all asked, would she have made the choice to say no if she wasn't in front of all those women? I don't know. I'd like to think so. But it tells me a couple things. One, she did have a lot of women with eyes on her. She was a queen. She had influence. Whatever decision she made really mattered. She made the right one. It cost her everything. I also pull a modern day lesson from that that I think as women as trusted women maybe it's good for us to invite women into these difficult choices and circumstances that we're in maybe we do make better choices when we are together not married with wine but together as women who care for one another who look up to one another so these guys who serve the king are freaking out thinking this husband and wife issue is a kingdom-wide issue they've got to make a law against it and it's funny because what law do they make they banish her forever from the presence of king xerxes which is precisely what she didn't want to do you see this is where i think you know she made a brave and honorable choice that cost her everything but i think maybe it didn't cost her everything because something god's been teaching me about himself lately to be really transparent with you is that when God withholds from us, when it seems like he's withholding from us, he is actually providing. He is actually giving generously and graciously and protecting us. And I think maybe even being banished and no longer having the title of queen would be better than being this guy's queen because she was never a queen to him, was she? She certainly wasn't being treated as one. Do you think she would have been treated as a queen if she'd said yes? No. But also queen was never her identity in the first place. It was a title. Certainly wasn't her treatment, but it's never been her identity. So you just got to look and wonder where God's hand is in this. He gets so angry. Then later when his anger subsides, he remembers her starts thinking about who she is, what she's done, and what he did. And it's interesting, even though it doesn't tell us what he's thinking about, it does tell us that immediately his personal attendants are saying, let's go search the whole kingdom and find a new bride for you. It's a heartbreaking story. I don't know how that resonates with you, but like I said, I wish I had heard it when I was a lot younger. This woman who was free, empowered, and encouraged to say no and honored for it. Yeah, it cost her everything, just about it seems, but not in the eyes of God. Y'all, he's given us these stories for a reason. I want to invite you to talk around your tables how you see your story and her story, but I know that's a big ask, and so something God put on my heart, if you'll take a minute, is to share with you how I see her story in mine, which i got to be really frank with you, takes... Um, the grace of Jesus. <laughs> so I say I wish I heard this when I was younger because, um, yeah, when I was in high school, there was uh, this guy named Daniel who uh, went to a church at another town. And I had good friends who were like, oh, you're going to love Daniel. He's amazing. He's one of the greatest leaders in our youth group. I was going into my junior year of high school, 16, almost 17. He was going into college. And um, so I meet him and 
you know, that my friends were like, you'll be perfect together. So I meet him, and already before we meet, I'm like, we're perfect together. So I meet him, and that's what I think, right? That's how teen girls work. To be honest, I wasn't attracted to him. That should have been the first sign. Attraction's not the most important thing, but it is important. So if you're not attracted, take it as a sign from God. That's not your guy. <laughs> Nevertheless, I learned that now, not then. He was attracted to me, very much so. Uh, he had not dated before, not kissed before. I dated one guy, I kissed him. Uh, so the night that Daniel first kissed me, I was no longer me. No longer Megan. I immediately can pinpoint that's when I became a possession, an object for pleasure, like Vashti. Part of my story is I've never been able to just kiss somebody. They've always wanted to make out, but also I only dated those two guys in high school, so that's part of it. But um, nevertheless, uh, this relationship continues, and um, one night, you know, I praise God. It's his grace upon grace upon grace that I am waiting to have sex until I'm married with my husband, if I ever am. Um, that's grace. But one night, Daniel got a little little too, too frisky and uh, did some things that only a husband should do. So after that, he's driving home, and I call him, and I'm like, Daniel, um, I feel really bad about what happened tonight. It wasn't okay. And um, you can like hold my hand, but I don't think we should kiss for a while because I don't trust us. And he was fuming, mad, infuriated, much like the king. Um, very not happy with that idea. And then finally he warms up to it. And when he does, he says, Megan, I used to see you as this beautiful white rose. And now it's like you've been thrown on the ground, walked all over, you're dirty, you're used, and you're worthless. Now, y'all, that was half my life ago. God healed me from that a long time ago. But isn't, isn't it funny? I still remember every one of those words on the other end of the line. Two weeks later, I was visiting my friends, and he was supposed to pick me up and take me on a date to downtown Fort Worth, and he ended up cheating on me. I guess he wasn't getting what he wanted from me, and he found it from somebody else. But I thank God that I was cheated on because it made me fall in love with his word in such a way I never had before. He... Saved me when I was seven. I fell in love with Jesus when I was seven years old. And when I was almost 17, I fell in love with his word. And I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> that I just shared with you is one of the hardest parts of my story. By no means was I in the same circumstance as Queen Vashti. But I'm grateful that God gave me the courage to say no. And it did cost me. My gosh, being cheated on is one of the biggest pains I've ever experienced. And I was still really ashamed about how far we had gone, even if we didn't go all the way. Um, kept that to myself. That was September. He cheated. Uh, it wasn't until June of the next year. I was at a youth camp, and I'm talking with one of the girls I thought was my best friend, and I tell her about what I had done with Daniel, and she says, Megan, I'm so disappointed in you. Let it be known that's not the way to respond to somebody who's been hiding in sin for almost a year, beating themselves up for it. So it wasn't until that November that I had a Disciple Now leader who loved God and me enough to tell me, you know what, you haven't forgiven yourself. <laughs> That's important. So God did free me. Why do I tell you this story? <laughs> Because that's how I see Vashti in my story. That's how I see mine and hers. I desperately wish that I was 12 and 13 and hearing Vashti's story in youth ministry. I desperately wish that somebody had told me about this woman who was being pressured by somebody in a position of power to say yes, to be degraded, humiliated, to give herself away, and she could say no. And it would cost her but she would be honored, and God would use that to save a whole people, to make way for his own son to save us. Because you see, this horrible king points us to the one true king, Jesus. He does not degrade us. He sees us. He sees me on that night, loves me so much he dies for me. Loves to love us. He's kind. He's patient. He doesn't get angry like this. He doesn't push us down. He lifts us up. He gives us dignity. Gives us a new identity. Treats us as royalty because we are in him daughters of the most high king. He's a good king. The best. King Xerxes is not so great, but King Jesus, that's the guy who has my heart. I pray that you're encouraged by Vashti's story. And I don't know for you, I don't know. I don't know if you're dating somebody, if you're married. Maybe 
it's not a guy who you need to say no to right now. Maybe it's something else that's demanding something of you that they don't deserve, like work. Y'all, I'm struggling with being a workaholic right now, and I do it in the name of Jesus, no less. God is slowly teaching me how to say no. What do you need to say no to tonight? And how do you see your story and her story? These are the stories, y'all. These are the stories that we need to pass down. And I know that's hard to hear, but I, I can't say enough. Y'all, we have an option. There are younger women coming up behind us and peers. We've got to share our stories. We've got to share Vashti's story. Because I thought I was the only one. I let the enemy keep me silent and ashamed so long. And we are not alone. I can promise you that. If I sit down with every one of you right now and you tell me how you see Vashti, your, self, your story and Vashti's story, I know every one of you has a story. Every single one. And I'm telling you, people need to hear it. And I know that's hard. And it's messy. Y'all, it is so scary for me to share some of that with y'all. But I share with you to say God is glorious. He can take the biggest mess, we just sang it, what the enemy means for evil, he turns for good and for his glory. He took the moment that somebody tried to shame me and hurt me, and Jesus gave me a love for his word that has never stopped since. Friends, how do you see your story in Vashti's story? Take time to talk around your tables for 10 minutes, and I'll wrap us up. All right. <laughs> I always hate wrapping us up like this, but our conversations can continue. Your stories are important. Also, plug to jump in a thread group because you have all month to dig in with friends. I, I did leave out a comment for you. I realized um, that <laughs> it is kind of important uh, in terms of how humiliating of an experience this would have been for Vashti. Uh, rabbis throughout history have interpreted when King Xerxes demands that she come before them wearing the royal crown, that he wanted her to wear that crown and nothing else. And uh, modern interpreters think maybe she would have been in her full, full royal garb, but actually they admit that either way it would have been the same as if she were to be asked to just appear before them uh, completely undressed without her crown. So it is um, so many things that were just really um, degrading and hard. And she said no. And um, I wanted to point you not only to our King Jesus, but Jesus, who was stripped bare before everybody, mocked, beaten, scorned, killed, put to death, hung on a cross for us, for us, so that we don't have to be. What a degrading experience for the king of all creation, and he willingly chose to do that for us. Whether you said no or didn't, I hope that there's no shame in this space tonight, and sometimes we don't have the freedom to say no. If something has happened to you in your life and you haven't talked to somebody about it to heal from that, um, we've got awesome people here at the center, here at the church I'd love to connect you with. Um, but don't keep that inside. Don't keep that inside. It festers in the dark and it'll tear us apart. Um, but I pray that Queen Vashti's story has been an encouragement to you. I hope that it sticks. I'm astounded. Personally, I think 2,500 years after this story, I do think it sticks. Because no amount of education is going to eradicate evil. This story needs to continue to be told. And I also want to clarify, it's not a story of men versus women. I hope you don't leave here as like man haters. That's not the goal. I would tell this same story to young guys. So, sorry, we've got some guys helping tonight. And I was actually really nervous about them hearing it. But I'm like, they've, y'all have, <laughs> I got the thumbs up. Y'all um, are experiencing stuff in school. I mean, the world is the world. Um, I was 16. So, um, this story needs to be told. Because whatever you're at, what, I mean, because I know girls, girls can be a little thirsty these days, right? And so I just say, <laughs> like, whatever the pressures are, you can say no. In Christ Jesus, whatever the pressures are, <laughs> she's dying. Um, you can say no by his spirit. This is what astounds me. Queen Vashti had the guts to say no. And she didn't even have a relationship with God. For all of us who have trusted in Jesus as our Savior, the same spirit that raised him from the dead lives in us. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead 
lives in us, sure enough, we are free to say no. No matter the cost, sis, you are not alone. You may lose everything, but God sees your no. He'll honor it, I promise you. Whatever it is that's asking us to give ourselves away is not worthy of it unless it's Jesus. I'll wrap up with this. I often tell teen girls, if you have a friend who tells you to fall head over heels in love with a guy, don't hold anything back. Just give him everything. That's a terrible friend. Because he'll hurt you at some point, whether he means to or not. He'll let you down, disappoint you. But that's the exact advice I would give you when it comes to Jesus. Fall head over heels in love. Don't hold anything back. Give him everything you have. Because he'll never hurt you. He'll suffer. Sure enough, we got a real enemy in this world. He won't ever hurt you. He'll heal you. He'll love you. You can trust him. He's entirely faithful. He'll carry you all the days of your lives. He's the only one worthy of all that we have. And he'll stop at nothing until we give him everything. So I pray with my whole heart for all of us that we would have the courage by his spirit to say no to anything that demands of us more than it deserves and that we would have the conviction to say yes to Jesus, to pour out our lives to him. He's worthy of it all. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for who you are. Thank you for loving every one of us, every moment of our lives. Thank you that we are not defined or confined by our past. We are defined by you. I pray if there's any woman in this room who has not yet said yes to you as Savior, that she will not step out of here without saying yes. Oh, you're worth it. God, would we believe the truth that you do not withhold from us. You provide for us. You protect us. You defend us. You give graciously and generously toward us. Would we believe that? The enemy wants so hard for us to believe that you're not good. But God, we choose to believe that you are. Would you show us what you want us to say no to in these days? And will you give us the courage to share our stories? You don't waste a single moment. I thank you for that. In your hands, Lord Jesus, nothing is wasted. And we certainly are not a waste. The fact that you saw us as worthy of giving your whole life, I'm never going to understand, but I'm going to live my whole life until you bring me home loving you back because of it and telling everybody I possibly can about it <laughs> because we're desperate for hope and healer in you Jesus would you change our story would you use us to change these stories these stories like the story of Vashti Lord Jesus you want to sanctify us before you come back so sanctify your sons and daughters make us more like you let us not look past the Vashti and rush to Esther God, we need to hear these stories. We need to learn from them, men and women, teen guys, teen girls. We need to learn from these stories. Accountability matters. Just because someone's powerful doesn't mean they're wise. Just because someone's surrounded by people doesn't mean they're kind. Let us look to you, most wise, most powerful, most kind and good. Let us walk in the way you have for us no matter what it costs. You're worthy of it. Amen.